Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar with Miguel Rosales. On uh, we are focused today on the bridges of Boston, but um, our speaker has wide experience with architecture and design of bridges. I have a couple of little housekeeping details before we get started. I'd like to um, let you know how to participate in today's event. You can submit questions by typing your question into the Q&A at the bottom of the control panel. As we have time, the presenters will address as many questions as they can during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. And we will be recording the webinar and we'll share the link after the event. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Peter Vanderwalker, who is a notable photographer and who has agreed to come and help us with this webinar today and uh, interview Miguel Rosales. So Peter, take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, my name is Peter Vanderwalker. I'm an architectural photographer and I'm the author of a book called The Big Dig, Reshaping an American City. And it's my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Miguel to you today. Uh, I'm gonna give you a little bit of his, uh, about Miguel. Uh, Miguel Rosales is the president and principal uh, designer of Rosales and Partners with over 30 years of experience as a leading bridge architect and designer for major infrastructure projects in the United States and abroad. Prior to forming Rosales and Partners, he served as the lead architect and urban designer on the Leonard Zakin Bunker Hill Bridge. He developed, he helped develop the innovative cable stayed bridge and guide, guide it through a complex public bridge, uh, uh, part public participation project uh, process. His major completed bridge projects include the Woodrow Wilson Memorial Bridge over the Potomac River in Washington, the Phyllis Tilly Memorial Pedestrian Bridge over the Trinity R River in Fort, Fort Worth, Texas, the Liberty Bridge in Greenville, South Carolina, Puente Centenario over the Panama Canal in Panama, and the Christian and John Markey Memorial Pedestrian Bridge in Revere. His recently completed projects include the restoration of the historic Longfellow Bridge in Boston and the Francis Appleton Pedestrian Bridge in Boston, Mass. If you have not had a chance to walk over the Appleton Pedestrian Bridge, do so. It's an absolutely lovely experience. Uh, Mr. Rosales is recognized internationally as an expert on bridge aesthetics and design. He received a diploma in architecture from Universidad de Francisco Marroquin in Guatemala City. In 1987, he completed a Master of Science in Architectural Studies at MIT. He has received grants from the NEA, National Endowment for the Arts, the AIA, and MIT to research bridge and infrastructure design and is the recipient of several bridge design awards. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Miguel today. Thank you, Peter. Um, well, I have to say that um, the title of my lecture is Welcome to Boston and Tony selected his name. And I thought it was very interesting because the three bridges I'm going to show you actually act as gateways at different levels. And they welcome you to Boston. We are lucky that in Boston, we have uh, very attractive bridges. That's not the case in other cities. And I'm going to speak to you about three of them. The first one is the Leonard P. Sekin Bunker Hill Bridge. Um, this bridge was completed about 15 years ago in 2003. And um, I would say it's the most visible contemporary bridge in Boston. And it has become famous because of its location, because of its design. And I would say also because it's new and different from all the other bridges that existed in Boston before it was built. Um, the bridge acts as a very important gateway from the north, you know, the island is three, and is very uh, uh, visible particularly along the Charles River and from a distance. So every time you see this bridge, you are associated to Boston. And that's something that when the design was being prepared, we didn't know exactly that was going to be the effect. And I have to say that it became iconic and a landmark very quickly. It didn't need to have many years for that to happen. And I'm going to try to explain to you some of the reasons why I think 
people in Boston have embraced this bridge. Um, one important aspect of this crossing is that it was located in an area that was not very attractive. There was a lot of abandoned sites, uh, industrial sites. And when this bridge was built, um, also parks next to the bridge were adopted and also built at the same time uh, over you know, some years. And that transformed the area. It gave them new identity, a new way to see at the city. And from a distance, you can see where the Chat River is because it's very confusing with the Museum of Science and you know, other obstacles in the way. It was really not possible to understand where uh, the crossing was. So it actually marked the crossing. Uh, we make it you know, quite special. Um, since there's some, some drawings that show the design, I would say that one important characteristic of this bridge is that it's inclined, you know, it's going into the tunnel in, on Causeway Street. So it had to have a 5% because we could not change Causeway Street and there were many constraints. So it's actually almost a miracle that this bridge is very well designed because there's many, many constraints and many, many issues to get to this level of design. Um, the towers are over 300 feet, which I think they're in good scale um, in the location because they are not too tall, but they are visible enough that you can you know, see the structure from a distance. One important component of this bridge is the cable arrangement, which is quite unique. And you can see it in the plan below. Um, the cables over the water are splaying out you know, towards, towards the edges of the beach. And the cables over the land are coming in. And, you know, I will explain why the reason for that, but that gives it a very, a very special uh, appearance when you cross the bridge because the cables are always changing. You know, they are not static. And this is another view that shows the cross section and, you know, one foot of the bridge. The bridge is very wide, it's 10 lanes wide. And when it was built, it was a record. They never been a cable bridge, you know, of this width, and it has uh, five um, lanes going north and south, and it has extra lanes going uh, to downtown, that is the cantilever. The cantilever in this structure also is quite unique because usually you want bridges to be completely symmetrical because, of course, if you have a cantilever, the load is going to go towards one direction, which you don't want. But in this case, it was decided that because the bridge was so wide, you know, 10 lanes wide, it was important to make a proportion of the towers where it will not look out of scale. And that's the reason for the cantilever. It's really an aesthetic reason. It's not really an structural reason. Another important thing of this bridge is the tower, which, you know, um, we spent many years looking at the tower. And I remember that, um, you know, Peter Van der Walker would take photos of us of the models of the tower. And uh, he did many models, you know, of the design until it was um, done correctly. Of course, one important piece of the tower is the upper part, which is supposed to be a symbol that relates to the Mount Bethel monument. But that piece was not there when I started working on the project. This is 1987. And you can see how terrible the infrastructure was at that time. Uh, we had a double deck structure um, that was serving the same purpose, but it had completely different appearance. And, uh, and this truss had deteriorated over time and it was uh, rusted and it didn't work very well because people had to make a connection between two sides of the bridge and it was done very fast. So there was always a lot of accidents. The other negative thing about this structure is that um, you came in in the bottom so you were coming you know, into a dark tunnel coming into Boston. So the welcoming to Boston was not there. This was really just a highway. And you know, many people wanted to change that. And the central artery gave the opportunity to make a better design. Um, here you can see both of them together at the same time, kind of like um, kind of beauty and the beast. <laughs> and, uh, and the thing is that the existing bridge could not be demolished until the other one was completely finished. Uh, the reason for that is because there is no way to put a temporary structure, um, especially with so many lanes. So we had to wait until one was finished to, for the one you know, to be demolished. Uh, if you look now at the Harbor Bridge, the North Washington Street Bridge, in that site that is in construction, which we have also been involved 
they build a temporary structure. So the bridge is already demolished, but in this case, we cannot do that. So that complicated and make uh, the construction quite difficult because you had to keep the existing. Um, part of this bridge is also part of a story of how a highway uh, can create a lot of controversy. And uh, this is Kim C. I don't know if people remember that, it's in 1990. And I had just started to work on the project and this was the design that was on the table. There were three bridges crossing the, the Charles. Uh, one was a double deck and two were a single deck. And uh, there were many ramps because what had happened is that, you know, this type of intersection interchange usually has four quadrants. But in this case, they were all stuck on top of each other. <laughs> so, you know, they were very, very high because the space was very tight and people were very angry and very upset, um, especially people from Charlestown. I would say they were most affected because they were going to look at this terrible highway um, for many decades to come if this was going to get built. And, uh, and this is a, it's a historic photo where I'm, I'm actually standing, you know, in the, in the uh, bed jacket. And I had just started working on the project. I had been there maybe, maybe like two years, year and a half. And um, you can see him all that we already have an idea of having a cables, a cable bridge. I always thought that it was important to have a cable bridge, and I have to say that was my idea to have a cable bridge, not the one that we have right now because that was evolving over time, but just the idea of having a cable bridge. And I think that came from the thinking that Boston needed something new. And because I was coming from abroad, I was not, I think I was not afraid and I was not intimidated by the history. I have felt that, you know, having a new structure that had never been built in Boston would be something to add. But the problem was that between the highways and the so many bridges, it was almost impossible to make a good design. So for example, here we had two cable state bridges next to each other, which have, they would not have looked very good. So luckily, you know, the bridge design review committee was formed in 1991, and um, through that process, we were able to take the highway down and make it much less imposing. So, so right now, there is several tunnels that put some of the highway on the ground, and then we were able to do just you know one bridge, which is the main bridge, and a smaller bridge. But it's um, it took a long process. This took two years um, to do the task force, and even after that, they could not reach a conclusion. Um, the conclusion of the bridge is done actually later, or at least the highway was already lower and narrower. And I think in a project like the Saking Bridge, there is always people that had had a lasting impact and without them, this project would have never been possible. One of course is Fred Salgucci, who had the idea to do the central artery. And, um, and he wanted the project to be built uh, very badly. And it was very controversial. And the scheme C was getting in the way of getting the permissions you know, from the environmental agencies and the DCR. And he's the one that agreed to do a cable state bridge and put it into the environmental impact statement. And that's how you know, the second bridge becomes possible because the Secretary of Transportation was supportive. Then there were two people in the staff. One is Michael Lewis, who was the design manager the most of the time that the design was being completed and the construction. And I have to give him credit because even after, after the project started to you know, become very, very expensive, he kept the design of the second bridge intact. And you know, he's built the way it was supposed to be. So he deserves credit for that. And of course, Rebecca Barnes, she was my boss at the Central Artery and she wanted to have a beautiful structure. And she made sure that during the year that she was there, that would happen. So without these three people, I would say that, you know, the politics and all the controversies uh, will not have been resolved and we will not have the, the second bridge. And of course, uh, we have Christian Men. Christian Men was a very famous bridge engineer from Switzerland. And when the task force uh, was formed, they wanted to have an independent uh, person that had experience on bridges to come to see the project and give advice on what could be done. And he had been in um, Harvard uh, for a lecture and, um, and we met him there. And, you know, I had, I was had, I had been asked to recommend a 
an bridge engineer to come to work for the task force. And I wasn't thinking about Christian May because he was mostly famous for arches, you know, over the beautiful ravines and over mountains in Switzerland. But he had not done many cable bridges, but he had thought about cable bridges. And um, he had many ideas about cable bridges. Um, so he was hired by the, by the task force and um, he agreed that it should be a cable bridge. And that gave a lot of credibility. And then, you know, I worked with him for many years and he is an instrumental person because without him, again, the design would not be the, the one it is now. And I think I spent over five years afterwards, you know, trying to make sure that the design would be the way that was supposed to be envisioned. Um, and here are some renderings of the design. Again, you know, you look at the renderings, it looks very close to what was built. So that's, uh, that's really a, a something to commend the Mass DOT, which at that time was not the Mass DOT, you know, was the central project, had quite a different name, but uh, the, the members of the Mass DOT deserve a lot of credit for building this structure. Um, one in, interesting about this bridge is it was, it was very inexpensive. It only cost 112 million. If you compare 112 million with the 15 plus billion of the central artery, you can see that it's just a fraction of the total of the tunnel and the whole project. But the, the reward from this bridge has been amazing. So I will always advise clients that if they can build a beautiful bridge, do it because the rewards and what you're going to get back is going to be enormous. I mean, now, you know, people pay extra to be close to the bridge. If you are in a condo that has a view, you will pay more than if you don't have a view of the bridge. And that's, you know, something that changed the area. I mean, many high rises have been built around it and actually there's more proposed around it and they all want to be close to the bridge because of the views. So just the investment on real estate and the development of the area, the bridge more than paid in itself. You know, so it, it's been a, a bonanza from this bridge in terms of how it impact Boston. And here's actually a photo of Peter of the model. I don't know if he remember, but he took that photo and the, and the build bridge. And you can see the visual relationship and how the two looks exactly the same. And I think that's, that's amazing that the design could be built, you know, which is developed quality. And um, of course the construction was very complicated. You can see here the existing bridge in the back. And then we had to move the tower enough so the last cable would not hit the double deck. Um, it was built in two parts, you know, the two towers were built first and then cables were added, you know, one by one and was a cantilever construction. And you can see a view here with, you know, the bridge is in cantilever and it's supported by the cables. And this is a, um, a quite a good view because it shows that the cables are doing the work they're supposed to do. And um, another view here before it opened, and uh, this is the Mother Day's walk in 2002. Many people came to see the bridge when it had not open and have any cars. Unfortunately, um, the bridge doesn't have sidewalks. So that view, you can never have it. Um, I tried to uh, convince the DOT to uh, close the bridge for a 15 year anniversary, which was a few years ago. Um, and they agreed at the beginning, but then when they start to see the logistics of closing the inter inter interchange and then all the um, security that was needed and you know terrorism and the travel highway approval finally they gave up and uh, you know so i'm not sure it will ever be open again to the public but it's an amazing experience i've been there uh, many times afterwards because um, you know most recently the lights were changed and um, i was invited to come back uh, by the mass DOT to inspect you know how the lighting was done on the towers and you know it's an amazing experience to be there because then you can understand the scale of the structure and you can walk and touch the cables. Um, what I mentioned before is that together with which these parks were built, um, you know, someday in the future, you'll be able to walk from Boston all the way to the harbor yes. uh, on pedestrian bridges. And, um, and it's a completely different area. This, as Peter had mentioned, um, was the lost mile of the Charles River. You could never find it <laughs> because, you know, the river was kind of lost up below bridges and highways and, and now it's much more open and you know, much more attractive. And here's some other views of these parks with the bridge together. And more views of the park. 
from a distance. Um, I'm always aware of how the bridge is used as the iconography of the city and how it's such a landmark compared to the other landmarks that we had. Um, and uh, that was unexpected. I didn't think that you know, it was going to be like that because not many bridges achieve that uh, kind of distinction, but this does. And I think make, makes people very proud of the city. And it's been used in many, many ways. Uh, you know, it's in covers of books. For example, this one's called Master Pieces of Bridge Architecture and Design. Uh, it's in bags, it's in uh, chocolates at the, at the airport. I mean, you see it everywhere. So it's really part of the, you know, part of the city. And uh, these are, you know, some sort of inspiration. Of course, the sailboats, the white color of the cables comes from that idea. Um, the US Constitution was very close to the bridge and you were able to see the Constitution from, from the bridge. And of course, the Bunker Hill Monument. I have to tell you something. When the bridge was being completed, the design, there were some people opposed to the second bridge. Um, they felt that it was too alien for this area. And of course, Boston had never had a cable bridge. And um, I thought it was important to have some homage to the history of the area. And you know, that's the reason that the tower is very similar to the Bunker Hill Tower at the top. And I think just because that was done, um, it made people happy, it kind of make people think that the bridge belong more to Boston. So that was, that was again, it's an aesthetic consideration, it was not really needed for structure. Here's another view. If you look at the last cable at the top, you could have cut the tower at that point and there will not be any Bunker Hill Tower on the top. That was what you needed for structure, but then we added you know, the piece at the top for, for design and to symbolize that piece on Charleston. And you can see the three towers together actually. Um, of course, the, the details are very important and I spent many, many years on the architectural details. For example, if you notice the tower is not flat on the side, it has angles. And the reason for that is that if you see it from a distance, one part is in shadow and one part is in light. So it looks a lot thinner. Um, the cable anchors are quite elegant because you see the cable all the way down and it's not enclosed in a box. If you see all the cable state bridges, the, the cable is not visible where it connects to the deck. And I think that was an important element. From the bottom, um, I spent a lot of time thinking how to make it better. So there is this uh, grill at the bottom that covers a lot of the girders and uh, it has two purposes. One is said for maintenance, people can walk inside the bridge and the other one, it encloses the structure so it looks more like a airport wing, you know, kind of a plane. And so actually, if you are under the bridge, it's actually quite attractive. I wish they would do more events under the bridge because there was a lot of time spent on the design of the area under the bridge. And of course, there are these openings, which I, I always wanted to have because I felt if the bridge was too wide, it was nice to have some sunlight coming into the water. And, um, and these openings were added as a reason, an environmental reason, um, but they didn't start there. They said that if these openings were there, the fish was going to be uh, less inclined to be disoriented, uh, but that's not the reason. It's really an aesthetic reason. We actually made that another reason later, <laughs> so it could get approved, uh, but it wasn't an environmental reason. It was really an aesthetic reason because I thought it was important to have a lighter day. You know, at 10 lanes, you know, having a lighter deck was going to help. Um, this is some other views from the side. You know, an artist was hired um, to do this design, uh, which has been, I think, been fairly successful in terms around, you know, as part of the train system. Again, you can see the, the relationship of the angles of the towers and, and the art. Um, this is from carpenter, carpenter design. Of course, at night, um, it's a very important part of the bridge, you know, it's illuminated. I think it would be nice if more lights were renovated. I mean, the only lights that have been renovated are the ones in the tower, but the cable lights could also be renovated. And I hope the DOT does that sometime in the future. Um, and uh, it makes a huge difference, it makes it a different presence. And of course, you know, for a special events, these lights are changed. Um, so you can have it for Christmas, you can have it for, uh, breast cancer. So I think that's something that it becomes, you know, also part of making the bridge iconic. And um, actually this is a photo from the Legoland. Um, the art, the designer of the Legoland asked me for the plans and I gave him the plans and I think he's a good, a good uh, 
depiction of the bridge in the Lego line. So you go to Lego line, uh, you can you can see the cable bridge and it's also illuminated in blue. Um, with some other views. Um, I have a quick story about the lighting. Um, I know you remember, but at some point, uh, maybe 12 years ago, I don't remember, maybe a decade ago, the lights were turned off of the bridge because you know the the highway authority was thinking that it was going to cost too much money to keep the lights on, and uh, people started sending me emails about it. Like, do you know the lights are going to turn off? Do you know that the bridge is dark? And uh, I was kind of rather upset because I thought the lighting was very important. And you know, to have this bridge without lights almost means like we are closed for business. You know, don't come to Boston. So. Um, the cost of these lights per month at that time was $5,000 per month. So I decided to donate $15,000 to keep it on for three months. And of course, you know, they were very surprised that the architect would give the money uh, for the lights, but it made them also embarrassed and they, they changed and they decided to turn the lights on and they actually returned my check. They never cashed it, uh, but it was, an important piece to say that this bridge is important and we should take care of it. And I think that, you know, the more people love the bridge, the better, because um, it's something they should be proud of and they should take care of it. Um, most recently, I've been involved on the Harbor Bridge, which is next to it, that's the North Washington Street Bridge. And I definitely took inspiration, you know, from the towers of the second bridge to do the piers of this bridge. So it's like an inverse, you know, it's like the wise inverse. and. Um, and also I try to, you know, make it in a way that will be compatible. So it's not competing, but it's complementary. And, and I think at night, the two of them together are going to look very good. Um, the, new, the new bridge over the harbor has much longer spans than the existing one that has been demolished. And it's going to have an overlook area in the middle, uh, which you're going to be able to see the second bridge in a nice way, you know, with illumination. And for the first time, we're going to have a panel uh, explaining about the bridge <laughs> because there is no place in Boston where you can read about the second bridge. Which got, it's kind of unusual because it's such a landmark, but it will explain something about the engineering, the architecture, and the history of, of the structure. Um, so you'll be able to stop and look at the bridge while you are crossing the new Charleston Bridge. Now I'm going to go to the Longfellow Bridge. The Longfellow Bridge is as important as the second bridge but it's a historic structure and uh, plays a similar role. I think that, you know, it's a nice entrance from Cambridge to Boston. Um, again, for a long time was uh, abandoned and not, not very well taken care. And it, it took a long time. I mean, I've worked on this project for 15 years and finally it was completed. Here are some of the views of the bridge are fully refurbished. Um, it's an amazing structure. It was very well designed from the beginning. Um, the towers, the arches, um, everything was thought through. So this is another case where the sun pays off on the bridge. And, you know, it will be very hard to demolish the structure. I think not only because of the history, but also because of the beauty and the location. So, you know, that has protected the bridge. Many historic bridges in the United States get demolished every year. And of course, you know, the setting is glorious. I mean, um, anybody that has crossed the bridge on the red line, We'll always remember the view of the Esplanade. I mean, it's, it's an amazing view and you know, very iconic. And um, the name is, uh, of the bridge came from uh, Henry was for Longfellow. And the story that he used to cross the old bridge that was there before this one was built, which was called the, the West Boston Bridge. And that was a, was a flat bridge. It was not elevated and it was actually a movable bridge. You know, it, it, it was a swing. And um, he wrote this poem you know, the bridge point. And uh, the poem actually made him quite famous. So after the Longfellow Bridge was finished in 1906, 1903, by the construction here, you can see the construction here of the towers. Um, some years passed, and then I think in the 20s, it was decided to name it after uh, Longfellow. Here are some other views. One interesting thing about this bridge is that it was multimodal from the beginning. It had cars, it had sidewalk, and it had the train, um, which make it you know, quite special. And the train, I would say, is the most important mode of transportation on this bridge because you get many, many more users, over 100,000 uh, people cross the bridge every day you know, on the train. 
Um, so from the beginning, it was envisioned in that way. Uh, it's interesting here, and Peter will appreciate like some of the historic part. You can see the bank, the uh, custom house tower in the, and the, and the, you know, the one side in the 1920s. You can also see where the Liberty Hotel is located. And of course, uh, you know, the Beacon Hill area. Again, this bridge is also very iconic. It's again, part of the iconography, iconography of the city. And it's fun when they show together the two bridges. For example, here they show the long fellow and the Seikin together. <laughs> I think that's interesting. Or here you can see the two of them together. Um, and um, it's really part of Boston. And I'm very happy that I was able to work on that project and make it the best it could be. And it's, you know, I've been in many paintings. Um, this one is interesting because the bridge had become so rusted and so abandoned that people thought it was orange, but that was never the color. You know, it's just that the rust was like so bad. And of course the view, I mean, the view from the train uh, is amazing when you see the spread and you come out of the tunnel. Kind of similar also to the second bridge when you come out of the tunnel. You don't expect, you know, that you want to see a bridge. You don't know Boston and you're coming out of the tunnel and you have this second grand bridge, you know, right at the mouth of the tunnel, it's quite unexpected. Same here, you get a surprise. You're never in Boston and you cross in the red line, you get a big surprise. Um, there are some views during, during before the construction, about 2010. Uh, it was in very bad condition. Um, the, the garden needed to be clean. Uh, the arches needed to be painted. And many pieces of the bridge uh, had been modified over time. So to bring it back, um, it was rather complicated. And it was done to the highest level of preservation. So since this bridge was finished, it has won all the top awards in preservation. Actually, most recently, it won the Palladio Award, and the award is going to give in Coral Gables, Florida, this December. And um, this is what you see when, you know, before. You had the highway lights. You can see plants growing on the sidewalk, which I think is kind of funny, uh, because it was in such a bad condition that the concrete had opened up, and plants could grow, you know, weeds could grow on the sidewalk. Um, the color of the granite was impacted because at some point um, the owners had decided to put an anti-graffiti coating and it had become very dark. So only the top of the tower was the original color. You can see the, the light gray color um, and the rest had become very, very dark because of the anti-graffiti coating. So, and the side was very, was very narrow. You know, both sides were very, very narrow. This is part of the construction. The construction took a lot longer than expected. It was supposed to be finished in three years, but actually it took a little bit more than five. And the cost also increased substantially. I think that um, it was, um, you know, very complicated. And a lot of things were discovered during the construction that meant to be adapted. For example, here you can see the towers were gone. The towers had to be taken down, numbered, and there's many pieces of granite that had to be numbered and taken barges, and then reconstruct the foundation because the towers were leaning and, you know, they could not stay. So. That's, that's an important element here. And here uh, they are putting back the last part of the tower, like a big puzzle. And each piece of granite had to be numbered. And they don't fit. If it's not for the right tower, it doesn't fit on the other tower. <laughs> so they have to be exact. And we cannot replace this granite because the granite is, to, the quarry is already gone. So when we were trying to finish some pieces of granite on other parts of the bridge, it was very hard to find the granite. They had to be scavenger from other bridges, you know, in, 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 the, in Massachusetts uh, to get the same of kind of Quincy granite. And uh, here the test of the colors, um, which I have to say that I always wanted these railings to be black and they were black for a long time. But then uh, some analysis were done over time and it was thought that originally they were not black and uh, they were supposed to be a color that resembled bronze. and. Uh, I was a little bit against it, but I accepted that it's part of the history. And if that was doing that color, you know, but then how do you, how do, you do bronze? So they, these tests were done and the color that is closer to actually the one that was selected. Um, so I think that was an homage, you know, to the renal paint. Um, here you can see, you know, before and after with the towers already clean. Um, of course the towers are, are very important. Give it the, the nickname, nickname, you know, the salt and paper bridge. Um, and all the, all the arches are original. Nothing had to be replaced, um, which was lucky. Only the columns are, some of them are changed. 
instead of the view here, the new gradient, the new, the new um, construction. A lot of effort was put on the lighting on this structure. Um, many years were spent on that because I think it was important to light it and make, make it you know, more prominent at night. Um, here's some drawings that we did at that time. Um, you know, it's rather complicated structure, has a lot of uh, utilities underneath because it's been there for over a hundred years. So, you know, they were added. So when the construction was being done, you had to change them, move them all around, and the train had to be moved too because the middle of the train was very damaged. So the train had to move to a, to a side and then put back. So the facing of the construction also was rather complicated, similar to the second bridge. And some other views here. Um, these lights that you see on the sides, those are the original design lights, but we decided to put them more as pedestrian lights because they are too low. And then um, I took inspiration from the catenaries that used to be there in the past, and we created this design that is a, a special design for the bridge, you know, so be able to be a little bit higher. And um, this bridge also had a, uh, a task force, and it also took two years to find a conclusion. But this task force was different from the one from the Safety Bridge. This was, was not about what design we're going to do. This was, was more about what is going to be allocated for each type of mode. And there was a lot of fights between the sidewalks, the bikes, and the cars. The train, of course, could not be moved because you know, there's only minimum amount of train that you can have. But the cars and the bike train and the sidewalk could be changed. So finally, it was decided that there will be two lanes coming into Boston with a, a bike lane of five feet and a sidewalk eight and a half uh, feet on this side, and then only one lane uh, outbound um, to Cambridge, going to Cambridge. Apparently, people that come to Boston don't go back to Cambridge. <laughs> so there is less traffic on one side of the bridge, which is unusual. So you know, this side of the, the bridge is much wider. You have 13 foot sidewalk, you have a wider bike lane, you only have one lane of traffic. Um, so there was, you know, there was a compromise. Like here's some, some views of the historic lamps, uh, which I studied very carefully. You know, this design was replicated exactly, and it was uh, you know, moved to the, to the niches, so it's more of a pedestrian light. And here you can see the design of the catenary. Um, I, of course, wanted to do the catenary exactly like this, and just add the pendant lights, but the MBTA veto to have something over the tracks. <laughs> so I had to, uh, you know, just do the sides because um, they didn't want to have the, I think the whole catenary would have been very nice, you know, with a different purpose. And here are some drawings that, you know, historic drawing that shows the lighting. This lighting on the, on the um, tower were also replicated exactly. We had the original drawings. You know, this, this bridge had been documented very well because when it was um, built, it was a big controversy because it was the first time that they're going to do a fixed structure, not movable. So it had to be taller. And you know, making it taller was unusual in Boston. All the bridges were flat, you know, like the Harvard Bridge, for example, the Mass Avenue Bridge. And this one became much taller because it had to be the navigation channel. So, um, so there was a lot of documentation about this structure. Here are some views, you know, at night, um, some details of the lights. These are the lights that go for the small towers. A lot of care was took, you know, in all the craftsmanship. These are the, the lights on the on the niches. Of course, this used to be a gas lamp, but now they're LED. Uh, so LED is enclosed here in the in the top. So actually, they are they are sustainable, but they have the appearance of the old lights, you know, to the exact detail. Some other of the details. Um, these are the doors. These are the bronze doors, and uh, you know there is a um, there are eight of them, and uh, you know, at each of the towers. And um, when I first went to see the doors, they were under a highway <laughs> near, sorry, near the um, uh, the I ninety three uh, highway, and uh, they were in boxes. And then we open it, you can see how damaged they were, and the knocker was not existing. It had a lot of graffiti. So apparently, in the sixties, the um, the DCR decided to remove the doors because they were getting damaged. And you know, these are very valuable doors. They are, being, they are cast uh, bronze doors and, um, and they were reproduced exactly. One of them was gone. We could not find it under the highway. 
and it had to be reproduced exactly at a very high cost. I think, you know, close to $200,000. Um, the same, you know, with the grates and the windows. I, I had to take a window and replicate it exactly with the same wood. Of course, not the same wood because the wood at that time, you know, you cannot keep it, but the same species of wood. Um, so it's an exact, but it has new windows. All the windows have been broken already and, you know, bears were living inside and it was a total mess. Um, so, you know, all of that was done. Um, this was clean. You know, these are very symbolic. They're supposed to symbolize uh, Ericsson, you know, the Vikings coming to North America at some point. Uh, and it has this, uh, the uh, seals of Boston uh, and Cambridge. Some pieces need to be more contemporary. Like for example, we had to add a railing here to make it more to code, but I think it was painted gray, you know, kind of people not notice it very much, but it was upgraded, you know, to the highest standards. It's another view here. Um, and in this view, you can see the next bridge I'm going to tell you about, which is the Appleton Bridge, which is next week, which is named after uh, Longfellow's wife. I think it's a, it's a very romantic structure. Um, I think it reminds you of Europe, you know, like if you were in Prague or, or Budapest um, because of the scale. Uh, we're lucky that it was so well designed and could be preserved. It wasn't inexpensive. It cost $300 million to, to, uh, to refurbish it. So if you compare that to the 112 million of the Second Bridge, this is more than twice. Of course, it's a different era and, uh, you know, it's, it's a different condition, but it's interesting to see how much it costs to preserve it. Some other views. This is, you know, starting uh, in the afternoon. And if you ever have a chance to take a boat and go under the bridge, I would recommend it, especially in the late afternoon when the lights start to come up, you know, the blue lights. Uh, it's an important experience. Some other views here. We also added lights to the inside of the towers. So if you notice now, there is a light, there's an LED light inside the tower and the glass actually has a reflection uh, a screen in the back, so you don't see the light. So it almost looks like, you know, like it's glowing. I thought that was good to do, so the towers will have traces and light. Some other views of the night views. And these are the blue lights. Um, you know, it's a very simple design. We put one light for each cable. So, you know, they basically, so for each part, sorry. So it's 12, 12 lights on both sides. and. Uh, you know, that's, that's how it works and it can be changed color, but it creates a very nice environment underneath, you know, from a distance. Um, I wanted to put more lights on the bridge, but, you know, the agency didn't want to, to put them. I think it would have been nice to illuminate the light that I was from the bottom, you know, with the Viking ship emblems, but um, maybe someday, you know, that can be done. Some other views. The lights. And of course, you know, this, this is blue because of the second bridge. Um, I thought these two bridges are landmarks in, in the city and it would be nice that they are color coordinated. So when the second bridge turns red, this takes red too. So I mean, the DOT makes it, uh, that, so it's called color coordinated. Um, and they actually accept requests. So if you have a good cause and you want one of these bridges to be illuminated in color, you can send a, a notice to the DOT and they will listen to you. Um, so try that if you have a special event some other views at night from the side. Um, here at night, you can see also how the blue relates into the towers and uh, you have this very nice reflection. Um, another advantage that this is blue is that because it's in the navigation channel. So, you know, red and green could not be the permanent color uh, because it will confuse the, the, the people that are navigating underneath. And um, now we come to the Appleton Bridge. Um, this is a pedestrian bridge. Uh, of course, it's next to the Longfellow. Um, I took inspiration on this bridge from the main bridge. So, you know, I selected to make a flat arch, very similar proportion to the flat arch, but of course this is new and the, the arches of the Longfellow are, you know, historic. Um, and I thought it was important to do a very transparent structure and higher. So you could see underneath the Longfellow bridge and it would not be, you know, kind of an obstacle. Um, it was a rather complicated design because it has to be ADA and the ramp had to cross, you know, at a certain point of restored drive. So a lot of time was spent on the design of the, of the how do you move on the bridge. And I thought that was important to do curves because those will be more complementary to the park. 
So there's very few straight pieces to it. Even the staircase coming down are curved. Um, and I think that you know, gives it a theme. A lot of detailing on how the structure works was done. Here's another view. Um, another thing I want to point out that when this piece was uh, proposed, that also came as a solution as part of the task force. This design, the, the, uh, the, bridge, the pedestrian bridge was not part of the project. It was added later and it was added in a way as a mitigation, you know, kind of like the parks in the city bridge. And, um, and many new connections were created that did not exist. Before, when you came down the towers, it was dead ends. But now you can go underneath the bridge, uh, you can go up to the Appleton Bridge. Uh, so, you know, all of that improved. All of these are ADA accessible. So that makes a huge difference. And also was made much wider. You know, the bridge was only about six and a half uh, feet wide. Now it's 14. And um, here um, you can see, you know, how the design works. Basically you have an arch that has this V-shaped uh, truss system. You can see the cross section and that becomes also part of the pier design, you know, the white piers. And this is also very similar to the second bridge, but in verse. <laughs> So I'm trying to use similar, uh, similar ideas. Uh, of course, the triangle is, is very strong. And the whole design is consistent from beginning to the top. So the fascia of the bridge is always the same width. So it creates this ribbon you know, of metal that uh, goes all across. These are some sketches that we did at the beginning. Um, I just wanted to, people to be convinced that it was going to be very transparent and very light. For the construction again was fairly complicated. Sort of that had to be closed, um, but the arch was installed one night, and um, I think it was done around four in the morning. And you know, once the arch was installed, then the construction could proceed. Um, there was also a lot of pieces to it, and uh, you know, all of that had to be fabricated off the site, and it was welded on site, which is unusual. Usually, the DOT will have bolts, and it will not look as elegant. And, but here they make an exception and everything is welded. So it's very smooth and you know, very, very well detailed. Um, of course, the same case here, we could not demolish the existing pedestrian bridge until the new one was built. So this one had to be designed so it would pass just underneath the other one and people could still walk. So you know, once one was finished, then the other one was demolished. And you can see the comparison. This bridge was very narrow, was very close to the Longfellow Beach. So it was actually impacting the historic view. So it was nice to push it away. Um, some other views from the side. A lot of people tell me that the, the, the piers look like the branches of the trees. And you notice here also the color matches the Longfellow. It's the same color. I thought it was important to make them the same color. So it's you know, somehow compatible. And also this darker color make them more thin, the pieces. This is the main arch. Um, the main arch is the, of course, the longest span of a solo drive, you know, a very long span, about 225 feet uh, long. And um, I thought it should be as grand as coming under the long fellow. So, you know, that's why you have this, this arch with no piers in the middle. Um, the arch is, is uh, very sculptural because it's wider at the center and narrow at the end. And I wanted to do that so they, they support that the border would not be too wide because I wanted to minimize the impact to the park. And I don't know if you can see here some of these cables. Um, um, the owner wanted to put some barrier so people could not walk <laughs> on the arch, you know, uh, because you, actually you can walk on the arch. So we put these cables to stop them. But I did a design that I think is quite elegant. And actually people think that it's part of the design, <laughs> but it's not part of the design. It's just to stop the people for, you know, walking over the arch, but I don't know who's going to walk over the arch. I mean, they walk, they will die probably on solo drive. So I don't know who people want to do that. Um, and of course, you know, walking on the bridges is, is, I would say it's amazing with all the trees and the greenery. I mean, you feel like you are like a, on a forest, but elevated. Um, then we created this overlook at the end, you know, where people can take photos of the Longfellow and the river. And you can see here the geometry of the staircases. I think the staircase are very important because if you don't want to, uh, if you don't want to uh, walk the ramps, you can take the staircase and come down quickly. So that is also uh, a functional part. Um, here you can see how it looks, you know, from underneath, how the relationship of the columns with the branches of the trees. It's a very direct connection there visually. 
and of course the, the metal fascia that continues all along, you know, like a river. Um, I spent a lot of time doing the design of the railing, so it will be very transparent, very clean. Uh, you know, so again, you can see the transparency and you can see the views of the Longfellow and the river. This from underneath. Also, I know a lot of care on how it looks from underneath. You know, everything is painted the same color, the cantilevers. I think bridges underneath should be designed as well as bridges on top, because so, long, so many people look, look at them from underneath, and many times that's forgotten. Um, here you can see the old and the new, you know, they come to this uh, octagonal plaza and they connect there and this connects to the other path. And I had to make sure this octagonal plaza match exactly. <laughs> so, because it's a pure octagon. So then we had to connect all the paths. And um, I think it's a nice way to bring the memory of the union of Longfellow and Appleton, you know, the wife and the husband. Some other views from the side. Um, of course, at night, you know, it's, it's quite spectacular. It has very um, nice lighting, small lighting, you know, pink lighting uh, that goes all along down the stairs, down the ramps, and some other views. You can, you know, get very nice views of the Hancock Tower from the side. You know, it's just in the, in the winter. Um, actually, the DCR plows this bridge, so you, you can use it in the snowstorms um, because it's just so vital. So many people close you know, um, to the area across this bridge, you know, on a daily basis, some of the views of the overlook. Um, these are some of the details. And you can see here the, the, the railings are inclined. So we had to somehow resolve how to connect two sides here and the cable become rods, but they're in the same spacing. So all those details count, I have to tell you, um, because people, even if they don't see them, um, so preliminary, you sense that it's a good design. So, you know, the detailing of the bridge is very important. Some other views at night from the side. And um, that's some um, end of my presentation. I hope you had a, a good uh, understanding of the three bridges. I think we are very lucky in Boston that we have these three bridges and um, they give a lot of sense of pride. Um, it shows how infrastructure um, doesn't need to be the enemy. It actually can be your friend. I mean, it actually can make things much better than without it. So this, this is a very good example of how, you know, you can create structures that are really the true art of bridge design, where um, it's not only the function, but also the, the architecture and the visual aspects are all combined together. And then you can get a great result. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's Thank great. you, Miguel. Um, You've really shown us that the smallest details on a, in bridge design count almost as much as the overall design. And uh, they're really elegant structures. It's been terrific um, you tell, having you tell us how you uh, thought about them as you designed them. Uh, I think we have time for some questions. And uh, I have one. Uh, I'm on the board of the Boston Preservation Alliance. and. Uh, we have been dealing with the city over the years on what to do with the old Northern Avenue bridge over the Port, Port Point Channel. And I'd love to hear what you think. So, uh, several designs have been proposed and one, one has been advanced by the city, but we, we'd love to hear your thinking on that, uh, uh, another gateway to Boston. Could you stop the screen share? Um, yes, I can do that. Okay. Perfect. Yep. Well, um, it's, um, it's interesting you asking me this question because as you know, the city of Boston is the owner of that bridge. So they are the ones that have been planning the new design. And, um, and the city of Boston is very familiar with my work because they're actually my clients for the North Washington City Bridge. And I competed for that bridge. I wanted to be the designer, you know, for the Northern Avenue, but I didn't win. Um, Another, another team won that design. And um, um, sometime, you know, a year ago, or maybe probably more, they asked me to propose something different because they were having some issues and I actually did a design. So actually I have done a design for that bridge and uh, you can see the design in my website. I think my design probably was too radical, um, but I think it would have been a beautiful bridge if you know, they wanted to do that one. Um, I think the problem with the Northern Avenue Bridge 
in my opinion, is that um, it's a hybrid between all and new, and it's not clear, you know, what is all and what is new. And um, I always find that very problematic because you can never replicate, replicate the long fellow piece, for example. I mean, the long fellow piece was built, you know, at that time, at that era, and it will be very hard to replicate. So when you have the romantic idea that you want to replicate something, I think to me, that's already a problem, but I think many people care about the Northern Avenue Bridge and they want it to be safe, but it, it's again a case where it was too late. You know, the bridge had gone so far without any maintenance and, and you know, to try to recuperate those pieces, it was impossible. The same case as the, uh, the Charleston Bridge, it was too late to restore that bridge too. Uh, you know, I mean, the pieces were actually falling down uh, on the on the harbor. So I think, to me, that's one of the problems that exist there. Trying to replicate the old without keeping the old bridge. I think that's a, great, that's a great point. That's a terrific point, and I think it's a it's a pro, It's almost the the impossible problem. I remember well when the. Um, Structural engineers came, uh, we, we uh, on the Preservation Alliance wanted the bridge to be restored to it, so it's all old, old grandeur. And the uh, structural engineers came to us and said, we can give you the old Northern Avenue bridge perfect, just the way it was, but 96% of the bridge will be brand new. <laughs> it was just, it was rusted out, it was just gone. And I think, I think that's too bad. I, I'm reminded too of um, in 1998 or nine, uh, a group of us got together to try to save the old Colony Railroad Bridge, which is a wonderful offset um, bas uh, rolling lift bascule bridge at the end of the Massachusetts Turnpike. And, and we all, everybody wanted to save it, everybody. And none of us could figure out how to do it. It, it's there's one tiny little piece of it left uh, sitting on this edge of the Fort Point Channel. It was just a, a loss. I got some great photographs of the bridge, but it's not, only, it's not only here in Boston. Many bridges are lost every year. Historic bridges. I mean, it's it's really it's really sad. Mainly because they've been abandoned too long, or there is not enough funding. I mean, just take a look how much it costs to restore the Long Fellow. Three hundred million dollars. It's not a small amount of money. Right. And you have to have a client that is completely committed, you know, either because they have promised that they will do it to other people or because they have, you know, their own conviction that that's the thing to do. And, and I think here we were lucky that my city was completely committed to the long fellow to do it to the highest standard. And, and we are beneficiaries of that. Good point. It's a great point. If, if there are other questions, we're, we're open for business. We have some questions in the Q&A. Um, who or what is inside of the Longfellow Towers? Well, the Longfellow Towers were never uh, meant to be open to the public. Um, they were really a decorative tower and you know they were done to mark the navigation channel and give it a presence from a distance. And they're actually quite small inside. When I first came into the towers, you know, we had to actually find the key of the door, which was rather complicated. Nobody knew where the key was. Um, they were completely destroyed. They had been a spiral staircase inside that you could get to the top, but it was gone. And I, thousands of birds, you know, seagulls were living inside. So you can imagine the mess. Um, so they are not open to the public. However, we replaced the staircase it's not the same type of staircase that there used to be there. There used to be a nice spiral staircase. It's a different staircase because um, it needs to be up to code and also because the towers were reinforced inside. You know, the towers have a, a grand, a um, concrete core that did not exist and that's new. So, you know, the staircase had to be modified. Um, I think that if somebody can get into the towers, it'll be interesting for you to see because you can go all the way to the top and you can see from the little window out. Um, but I don't know if the DCR will allow that. Actually, now the DOT, the DOT owns the bridge now, not the DCR. Any other questions? Somebody also asked, uh, what is the design lifetime of the Zakim Bridge? Well, the Zakim Bridge, because it's in such a critical location, can you imagine you have to close the Zakim Bridge? the traffic would be absolutely a nightmare. So usually that type of bridge, which is in a critical interstate location, is designed 
to be between 100, 125, 150 years uh, without major repairs. Um, luckily, the bridge has worked very well. There hasn't been any time that you had to close it for a long time. You know, some of the cables have to be calibrated at some point, you know, there's some repairs due to the towers, um, but it's a vital structure. So it should not need to have any major repairs, you know, if it's maintained regularly for at least a hundred years, I would say. And, and what was the most challenging part of designing and building the Zakim? Oh, <laughs> so many challenges. Uh, I don't know where to start. Um, I mean, I mean, I think it's, uh, he started with a little dream I have that we should have a cable bridge and then in the wall over almost seven years of discussions and fights and doing the design. Um, and I have to say that in the case of the second bridge, all the stars align to create that design. That doesn't happen all the time. You know, you sometimes don't have the client, sometimes you don't have the money, sometimes you don't have the support from the public. Um, sometimes there is not a designer, you know, there is nobody that can do it. Um, so luckily in the second bridge, you know, all of those things were together and that's why we have what we have. Um, I think I could tell you many challenges, but one that comes to mind is that how do you design an elegant bridge that is 10 and wise and it's not that long? Um, that's very difficult, you know, because the proportion of the structure is always very, very important. And if it had looked too, too fat, it would have never looked good. So, you know, that was a challenge, the 10 feet number, you know, the 10 lanes going across in one structure. That's, that was a big challenge. Somebody also wondered, uh, wondered if the ornate railing on the Longfellow was stolen, did it need to be reproduced? Um, the, the railing in the Longfellow has two parts. One is the main railing that you see when you walk, and the other one is the fascia. The fascia of the Longfellow uh, railing is a piece that goes underneath that hides the concrete deck. Um, that piece was falling down, you know, pieces that it was corroded and it was falling down into Storo Drive on the river. So those pieces were taken down, but the historic railing in, itself had to be um, stayed. That, that was still okay. The problem was that it was taken down, it was put on, a, on a, some site outside Boston and it was stolen because people that were taking care of it thought it was scrap. You know, it looked terrible. It was all rusted, you know, pieces falling apart. They thought it didn't have any value, but actually those were the original pieces. So I think they sold it for, I don't know, $7,000 or something like that. And it cost tens of thousands to replace it. I mean, you know, I think the people actually were put in prison, you know, the ones that stole it. Um, and talking about um, uh, vandalism, I know you've read the story that somebody was able to get into the tower of the Saking Bridge and steal the light. Somebody came into the Saking Bridge, forced the door. You know, inside the Saking Bridge, there is stairs. You can get all the way to the top. Uh, so they, he went all the way to the top and took the red light at the top and stole it and took it back. And nobody even noticed uh, until people decide where the lights went. So. Uh, that was interesting. Again, I think he was unstable, the person that did that. And again, he was put in prison. So don't do that. Don't try to stop till the lights from the bridge. <laughs> Any other questions? I think those are all of our questions. Well, thank you very much for listening to me. I mean, I think, again, we should all be very proud of the bridges of Boston. Um, we have an amazing uh, set of structures. And I hope that you all appreciate it and, you know, always feel like you know, they are part of your culture and part of your, of your life in a very positive way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank, thanks to everybody. Miguel, good to see you. Bye.